We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hi, Henriette. Um, hi, Ben. Henriette here. I'm here in the room. Um, I, I hope you can see me. I'm here with one other person. I'm unfortunately can't access the schedule, so I don't have the link. So I cannot join on Zoom. If you can just quickly email me the schedule, I'll be joining the session on Zoom. Thank you. Looking forward to it. I know one of our speakers will be uh, is Wisdom Donko, who will be in the room. Um, and and we had, uh, can you confirm you are in ballroom A? I'm in ballroom A, Ben, and I'm here with Marlena from the Secretariat. No one else has arrived, so our on-site speaker has not arrived. Can you give me an idea of how many people are online remotely while I wait for the link? Um, yeah, we have about 15 people. Excellent. I'll be joining them soon. This is a case of where virtual reality is more real than physical reality. Yes. And of course, um, the session is being recorded um, and streamed on YouTube. So there, there might be people watching live and there will be people who will be able to watch this um, after the fact on the recording. Yeah, there's, um, there's a problem with the Zoom links, as you, you may have heard. There's a... Uh... The website is down, so the the Zoom situation is problematic for many. So they a lot of going to be watching on YouTube. Yeah. So what we may have is a, is a session where um, a lot of our audience is actually after the fact, um, but we know this is being recorded and and people will be able to see it um, live as well as as well as afterwards. And I'm so happy I think to report the, that more people are coming up. Um, so we have more people in the room with us now, Ben. So please just go ahead and we'll catch up. Great. Thank you, Henriette. So why don't I start? It's three minutes past the hour. Um, and so I'm going to welcome you today to um, our digital future. This is... Um, a series of capacity building workshops that's co-organized by Microsoft and the IGF Secretariat. And this is the third session in the series. The previous ones have looked at um, the issues of cybersecurity and digital transformation. And with this third session taking place during the annual meeting, we decided to tie into uh, one of this annual meeting's two main focus areas. That's universal access and meaningful connectivity. Uh, and my colleague, um, Daniel Akinmade Emajulu has been driving this for Microsoft. Unfortunately, he's unwell and not able to participate today. Um, but we're, we're pressing ahead. And I think we even have um, someone called Lily, who has uh, agreed to step in as rapporteur. Um, so I'll introduce her later. Um, so this session today, we're thinking about this in the context of the sustainable development goals. And within SDG 9, there is a specific target to provide universal and affordable access in least developed countries by 2020. Now this deadline has uh, now obviously passed, but I think that just brings more urgency to understanding how we can tackle this issue. And the way that we hope the session will, will contribute is to provide a nuanced outline of the diverse roles that governments, regulators, the private sector, and other stakeholders need to play in order to deliver affordable universal internet access. We have four great speakers who are gonna provide these um, different perspectives in the discussion today. And um, we also want this to be interactive. After we hear from the speakers, we will open up for views from the audience. And we also have a poll that we will run in a few minutes. And again, at the end of the session, that will hopefully provide a sense of the impact we have with today's discussion. Um, but first, to help set the scene for us, 
Uh, I'm very happy to be able to ask Microsoft's Vice President for UN Affairs, John Frank, to provide us with some opening remarks. Um, John, can I pass over to you? Thank you, Ben. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for, for being with us today. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, Daniel uh, is not uh, with us today, but he is recovering and doing well. Um, this uh, session about capacity building, I think is important because as we've worked through the pandemic, I think it's very clear that we need to increase our capacity to bring connectivity to people. And the opportunity to discuss a multi-stakeholder set of roles is incredibly important because this is not going to be able to be solved by any one group by themselves. I mean, the private sector, the invisible hand of Adam Smith and the economics textbook is not going to solve this problem in any time frame that we can be happy with. Um, and, and so I think that we need to look at the current approaches that are taking place um, and and recognize a they're not adequate and b there's opportunities to improve them. Um, we've worked with um, the UN Tech Envoys Office and the International Peace Institute, um, and we've had a variety of workshops over this past year uh, talking about people-centered connectivity and and what all's engage what what all's involved in that. Um, too often discussions have been about infrastructure uh, and equipment and maps that show coverage and not enough discussion of people and measuring how many people are actually using the internet in an intensive way not just connecting periodically but but getting the full benefits that those of us in the connected world enjoy uh, and so i think as we've had these discussions I think it's focused on a few things. One, we need better measurements of usage. We need intensity of usage and we need gender information and demographic information about usage. Secondly, when we launch these projects, we need to think about affordability and the purchasing power of the population. We shouldn't just be targeting the top five or 10% of the purchasing power of a country. We need to be thinking about um, the entire population and look for solutions that, that bring connectivity at an affordable price um, and affordable devices for, for the broad population. We also need to think a great deal about digital skilling. Uh, it's the, you know, the capacity of people to um, enjoy the, the benefits um, of the internet in a responsible way and, and so thinking about capacity building and training of people, digital skills, and the employment opportunities that can be created are, are very important. Um, so there's a full range of skills from online literacy to professional development. Um, we need to think about how we um, create services uh, and are we delivering healthcare? Are we, are we enabling farmers to um, realize a higher, you know, higher income? Are, are we thinking about how um, education can be delivered online? Um, these are the kind of questions that ought to be thought about when we to start with the project, not just at the end afterwards. Um, so I think, you know, it, it is this kind of broad framework of a people de defined internet connectivity project that we're here to talk about. And so it's great that we've got this, um, this opportunity to have the discussion. Uh, it's even better if we can follow up and affect real change. And at the end, we'd like to be able to measure as going forward, the affordability, the breadth, and the positive impacts that the internet can be having in the least developed countries. Uh, it's a big project, but I think there's a unique moment now the pandemic has given us all a broad sense that we need to do more. And I'm very pleased to see that there are initiatives to increase funding for, for connecting uh, the least developed countries. Um, we will be going to Doha, um, we hope in January, for the least developed countries uh, fifth decennial conference that the UN is sponsoring. 
uh, Microsoft is is leading the private sector forum, and we think you know there we'll have an important session. We're hoping to bring together um, not just private sector but donor nations as well as international organizations and representatives from the senior political levels of least developed countries. Um, and one of the topics will certainly be how we can find new models of financing and partnering to bring greater connectivity uh, for the people in the least developed countries. And so with that, um, I'm looking forward to this discussion. Uh, and we have a wonderful group of people participating. And um, let's go to the discussion. Thank you. John, thank you very much. That, that, that was a really great way of setting the scene for our discussion today. Um, and I appreciate you joining us. Um, so in fact, we're ready to, to, to start hearing from those speakers. I understand there's um, a technical issue with a poll. So we are going to move um, directly um, through our four speakers and uh, to hear of, these, of the urgency of each stakeholder's role in, in providing access in least developing countries. And um, the first person we're going to hear from is um, Robert Pepper. He's the head of global connectivity policy and planning for Meta. Um, you probably know Meta is the company which has, amongst other things, the, the apps, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. Um, so, Pepper, let me hand over to you. Um, tell us about the private sector. Thank, thank, thanks, Ben. Um, and. Uh, Thanks for organizing this, and you know I couldn't agree more with uh, uh, you know John. Uh, you know the the issues that we're facing uh, are extremely important, um, and it's going to take all of us to do to to close the gaps. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about you know again the role of the of the private sector broadly um, and what we need to do. You know, and it is it is more than just the the connectivity. Um, is the internet available? Uh, the ITU just last week um, uh, released the latest data uh, from its indicators project and found well, there's huge progress, right? Over the last even two years, the number of people using the internet around the world has increased by over you know 17 percent. But nevertheless, there's still 2.9 billion people who are not using the internet. Um, if we look historically, um, just looking at the, at the connectivity layer, just the, the being able to connect, you know, the investments made to build that out, whether it started with telegraph and then telephone and now the internet and broadband has been predominantly um, financed by the private sector. And the private sector does this because, you know, private companies make money. Um, and so, you know, it's a business. But you know the the business and the business models and the costs associated with building out the networks um, have over time left gaps. Um, first with telephones, and then with the migration to mobile uh, broadband. Um, those gaps actually are closing significantly because the tech the cost of the technologies is coming down significantly, and with trends like. Um, you know, open disaggregated technologies, probably the, uh, the one people hear the most about is open RAN technology, open radio access ne uh, to networking technology. The cost of the technology is dropping uh, and the ability to deploy is becoming easier. And so the, the gaps that existed in the past because there was not a business model, those gaps are closing. Nevertheless, there are still places, and by the way, we now have new um, uh, low orbit, uh, low orbit Earth satellites, the LEOs. Uh, we have uh, new constellations. And so, you know, the technology is getting out there. Nevertheless, there will continue to be gaps. And, it's, and, and what we need are public-private partnerships with the private sector making its massive investments alongside um, you know, others who can help close the gaps. Let me give you a couple of very concrete examples. Um, policy. So, for example, in Peru, in rural Peru, the government had tried for years to connect, um, uh, even get just a 2G connection out to rural Peru. They tried universal service. They tried uh, satellite phones. They tried everything. Um, 
they it, it, it just nothing really um you know got traction nothing really took hold uh, they, they have great coverage in the in the urban areas and the semi-urban areas but in the very rural areas of peru it's remote there's mountains and so on what they did about four or five years ago is change the law to allow rural mobile infrastructure operators and because of that change in policy there was a new business model that became possible and meta alongside uh, telefonica uh, with some small with a small created a small wholesale operator and there was also partial funding from the Inter-American Development Bank, but no Peruvian government money, no universal service money. There is now a radio wholesale network, that uh, radio access network that's been built across rural Peru that any MNO, the, the MVNOs, the mobile virtual operators, are now connecting to. And you know these are places that didn't even have 2G connection. They now have a minimum, they have you know open RAN 4G connections for mobile broadband. And that was, you know, a partnership with government that recognized that a very small policy change could could unleash private investment alongside investment from uh, IADB, which is a very, very small part of that. You know, over the last, you know, uh, number of years, Meta has, through our investments, have, you know, connected and enabled much better connections for over 300 million people. We're currently building over 150,000 kilometers of subsea systems. Um, and you know, the most notable, of course, is the Two Africa project with seven other consortium members that's connecting over 30 countries with more than 41 landings. And it's the first cable to go all the way around Africa. Uh, it's going to connect up to Europe, the Middle East, and eventually over to India. These are, again, fundamental, necessary investments by the private sector, but it's not enough because there nevertheless will still be gaps. And so we, you know, it's really moving to a public-private partnership to fill those gaps. Thank you very much, Papa. And I'd like to come back to you with or just one question or, or clarification. So I, I, yeah, it's it's really important to get these new types of investment from the private sector. Are there any maybe Looking at the example of Peru, are there any regulatory changes that would would enable or facilitate these kind of new types of investment? So, an example is is the Internet para uh, Todos project um, in Peru. Uh, in addition to attract investments, on um, you know, we have a, 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 a several projects uh, partnering um, on fiber backhaul in uh, Africa, uh, we've, we have a network that's been up and running now for three years, uh, 770 kilometer backhaul network in Uganda to allow Airtel and other operators to go from 2G to 4G, they didn't have the backhaul. Uh, we're doing similar kinds of partnering projects um, in, in the DRC. Um, I do think that you know some very basic uh, policies having to do with um, uh, access to rights. Of, this is on the infrastructure side. Uh, I don't want to ignore the really important people-centered things that John's talked about uh, in terms of skills and relevant content and so on. But on the infrastructure side, um, we know that there are things that can facilitate um, competition with open cable landings, that facilitate subsea landings, that uh, allow for um, uh, internet exchange exchanges to be built on an open basis in countries that allow the exchange of traffic. And so some of the, the policy changes recognize the importance of shared networks, shared assets while maintaining competition. So wanting open access to landing stations, internet exchange points, access to rights away. Uh, and then of course, what's essential for mobile um, uh, broadband, whether it's mobile or other wireless technologies that Jane will talk about for, I hope, uh, I assume, uh, in terms of community networks, access to spectrum. Spectrum that is both unlicensed as well as licensed. And the, you know, there are community networks that are so essential uh, for providing services into areas that don't have traditional operators. And those community networks can then evolve into partnerships with existing operators. Thank you. In fact, you've um, 
you might not have seen it, but um, there, there was a comment from Jane in the chat noting that um, in terms of partnership, did not just the public sector and the private sector, but um, civil society, technical community, and local actors. So just as you mentioned there, uh, absolutely, so yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's 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 yeah, it's it's not public private. It's it's actually a multi-stakeholder partnership, right? And we have to move away from the notion of it was just governments or just private sector, but the whole, I mean, IGF is built around the multi-stakeholder, uh, you know, environment, which is, you know, civil society, academics, the technical community, the private sector, government, uh, we all have a, you know, a role to play. Um, and and that's, that's essential. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we'll move on. Um, I'm gonna change the order of speakers. Um, slightly, because um, just to allow for, for Wisdom, who's just arrived to, to to get some breath, he's in the in the meeting room in person. Um, I'm going to ask um, Tracy Hackshaw um, to talk, uh, and and you a variety of roles. You, you can introduce yourself, but I think we're particularly interesting in the context of this, today's discussion is that you're the co-chair of the IGF's Dynamic Coalition of Small Island Developing States. Um, and they uh, they have their own particular challenges, I think, sometimes in uh, in getting connectivity. So I wonder if you could talk to us about the um, the role of um, financial communities, the, the investment community, um, in in helping with these challenges. Um, ben Tracy, apologies. Just before Tracy, you start. Um, I just want to um, ask everyone who's in the room that if you wanted to follow the session and see the chat that's taking place, um, then you need to log into the Zoom room as well, if you've not done that already, but that will give you the full hybrid experience because people are using the chat as well. Back to you, Tracy and Ben. Thanks, Henriette. Thank Tracy. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Henriette, and thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, so, so Ben, Ben, indicated that I'm the, the co-chair of the DC SID, Small Island Developing States. Actually, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, which is a Caribbean island, um, currently doing work with the Universal Postal Union, uh, doing work with Dot Post and their projects. Um, and in relation to the question that's being posed, I, I, would, I would say that um, within underserved communities, you know, so small islands, least developed countries, landlocked developed countries. Um, the issues of you know, access, affordability, inclusion, um, they are really in competition for prioritization um, in those countries by governments and state actors. Um, to a large extent in, in, in those regions and those countries where we have these issues, they're still grappling with issues of, of basic infrastructure. And I, I don't want to sound you know, negative, but there are still issues of roads and, and access to water, access to, to, um, to basic services. So when you talk about access to the internet and, and have digital inclusion issues, you are effectively competing with those larger issues that the government has to deal with at the day and the country has to deal with. It's related to crime, and, and um, in, in my part of the world, we have uh, an issue with um, drug trafficking from South America to North America, and that creates a whole series of, of spin off um, challenges. So, when you're competing with these things, you, you have to realize that a government or a state, enter a state actor um, almost deprioritizes digital inclusion over these larger issues which um, can fundamentally destabilize a country. Um, so we have a heavy reliance in, in our part of the world on the work of international developmental agencies, such as the World Bank, the UNDP, um, the development banks like the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and so on. And even <clears throat> groups like the Commonwealth and the Francophonie groups and so on, who who provide that sort of developmental funding, but even there, um, then and others, there's competition even within the development agencies for that, that funding. Um, so funding to be 
provided for basic infrastructure needs, you know, water projects, projects related to crime and, and infrastructure versus digital economy projects and access and inclusion projects. And even there, <laughs> within if there's a digital space, you're competing now for what digital projects do we what do we wish to fund? Do we fund um, access projects? Do we fund entrepreneurship projects? Do we fund projects related to um, issues in terms of digital, even digital literacy in the first place? So how do we how do you deal with these issues? Um, now, especially in small developing states, I, I would suggest that traditional banking and finance are. Uh, um, in that investment community referred to are, are, are generally reluctant and, and even resistant to providing financing um, in, for capacity building and access and inclusion, far less for digital entrepreneurship and other issues. Um, while in the OECD countries and developed countries, you find that um, this gap can be filled by venture capital and um, angel investment. Within SIDS and other countries of that nature, this sector is very immature, um, very lean. And once again, even there, you have competition for resources. So we talk about it in terms of you know, access to financing and what's available, but just this competition and prioritization, I think has not been dealt with sufficiently in our discussions on, on, on this issue. Maybe one approach that I could, could speak about um, in terms of being a, po a positive spin, um, and get, given the work I'm doing with the um, post, is that there's a way we can probably piggyback on existing projects that have funding and, and, and capacity from the international development agencies. So, for example, the postal sector, um, where they're building out, you know, additional access to services, um, digital services, digital financial services. In doing that, there needs to be built the access needs to be built out in the first place. So as you go out and build all these access centers and physical facilities in rural and underserved areas within the countries, um, by definition, you can be building out access uh, and, and building capacity within those countries. So I think um, that's, a, that's one useful area where the Universal Postal Union has been um, providing that sort of support. And we can look at other agencies who are maybe non-traditional uh, financial services agencies uh, um, in the UN system and, and, and otherwise the ITU, for example, to perhaps provide that additional support uh, without having to compete for these resources and digital projects. And what I found, um, just to wrap this, this point up, is that when you look at you know, providing this digital support, the service support, many countries and many agencies do not look first at the access issue. So there's an assumption that when you provide this, this financing, that the access is already there. And because the narrative around the world has been, we've reached you know, maybe a two thirds connectivity, many, uh, you know, many reports over 77%, 75% connectivity. But as you know, A4 AI and the W3C talk about meaningful access and affordable access. So just having the availability of you know, 3G, 4G, even 5G networks, having it available doesn't necessarily mean it's affordable and it's, and it's available to be used by uh, people in certain areas, and even the quality of the access, the speed of the, perf the performance, the quality of service is, is, is challenged. And um, you have electricity needs, and I'm sure when we talk about that with the African nations, um, whether or not we can actually talk about the basic fundamental issues of, of electricity and trying to provide that access. So I think there are a lot of underlying and complex issues related to this, and hopefully this, um, the financial community will be able to address it by reprioritizing access and inclusion over and above maybe other issues that are currently being um, they're facing and being addressed by governments who, who talk to them. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Tracy. That's, that's, so that's really interesting because there's obviously um, a bit of a, you know, we think, I think sometimes we think about connectivity as enabling the the pursuit of these other sustainable development goals it's the enabling sdg um and without it in place it, it's hard to do the other things um but it's a very good point that we're that, that, yeah the access is, is often competing with really big societal issues and so that's a that's a neat 
um, solution about piggybacking on, on existing projects um, and getting the access as part of it. And in fact, that's that's a, a really good segue to the next speaker because you're talking about um, other sectors of government which might have interest in, in financial services or tourism or education uh, and getting them to think about connectivity as part of achieving their own goals. And that's really what we, we were hoping to hear about from um, our third speaker, um, Wisdom Donko, who's with um, the Africa Open Data and Internet Research Foundation. Um, Wisdom, are you able, are you in the room now, I think, and able to take the mic? Yes, I'm in a room. Um, yes, yeah, so I wonder, yeah, we can hear you. Um, I'm not sure if we can see you, but we can certainly hear you. Um, and yeah, I wonder if you could um, talk to us about the need for a whole of government approaches, whole of government roadmaps, um, and how that can play into uh, resolving the, the connectivity challenges we're discussing today. the president and CEO for Africa Open Data and Internet Research Foundation. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, and also thank you for bringing me on this session. Uh, I will say I did work with government before from 2011 up to 2012 before I assumed the role with Africa Open Data. So I'll try to outline one or two points, um, what government should do. Uh, whilst we all know roadmap gives uh, direction to uh, uh, destination, destination, uh, government, um, with government, especially in the developing countries uh, have uh, they are priority areas, and uh, sometimes uh, we do have uh, technology uh, as one of their priority, but then you see some a different direction when it comes uh, to that, and then uh, I will be outlining uh, that. So the first one uh, that I would like to touch on is one. Um, the central government is key in planning, in planning all of uh, these roadmaps, but the ultimate impl implementation should be uh, by the local government in collaboration with uh, local authorities and leaders. What we see in developing countries uh, is that though government have the policies and all that, they tend to implement those, uh, those policies themselves. And most times uh, forgetting about the, the leaders in uh, the communities. So when a program is being implemented, uh, you see it as a white elephant. Yes, so um, that's one area that we need to concentrate on and see how government can be helped to uh, uh, straighten some of their policies uh, towards the community uh, leaders. So one size fits um, all approved from the global world does not work in the developing world, but incentives, transfer of technology, skills, finance, and all that. Yeah, what we also realize um, is that when it comes to implementing some of this uh, uh, technological projects, you know, government try to partner with a private organization. And most times these private organizations comes from outside of um, the country. And then when they bring them, they bring the consultants and then when those projects are being implemented, uh, that transfer of knowledge is not there. That transfer of skills is not there. So when they hand over the project and they leave, uh, people who were not part uh, on the project uh, don't see the need to even uh, be part of the project when the project, when the uh, original implementers of those projects uh, uh, left. So we, we also have to look at this 
and make sure that if there is such project, the locals should be involved, uh, should be involved from day one uh, up to the last day. And when the contractors leave, uh, we can have that continue, continuity of uh, those uh, projects. Uh, the third point, uh, I'll talk about the enabling environment for private sectors to, to strive uh, is key, but investment incentives have to be geared towards uh, host countries, enjoying local content skills transfer with a stipulated uh, period. Yes, and this is another key uh, point that we have to look at, especially when it comes to local content. Um, I'll give example uh, with the agri sector. Um, agri sector, there is, let's say agri sector employs about, I should say almost about 70 to 80% of the population within Africa. In my country, about 70 or 80%. And that applies to most of the other countries in uh, Africa. So when we take that sector alone, you can just imagine uh, how much employment uh, will be generated through technology if uh, uh, we're able to implement it very well. An example, you have a farmer who farms uh, in a rural community, but then internet is not reaching there. And then if internet is reaching there, sometimes that local content that they need is not there. Local content is such that, let's say weather, for example, the farmer would like to know the weather patterns, where a farmer, when a farmer, farmer should plant uh, his uh, 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 produce, or sometimes there's a particular uh, disease that is being, uh, that a plant is being affected by a plant, infected uh, by a plant. The farmer would like to know what type of disease is that, so if, if that local content is there, all that the farmer needs to do is uh, take the phone, the application is on it, the farmer should be able to what, uh, transmit or take a photo of that disease and then once that photo is being transmitted into a central database, it analyzes the, the type of disease and then uh, a kind of a feedback report is being sent to the farmer in the local language. I think uh, with this, we, we should be solving a problem. And then the, the fourth point, uh, bridging the digital divide holistically will be achieved only from the grassroots, small towns, villages, uh, marginalized, um, are connected to internet in a meaningful way. Yes, uh, this is um, another point we are talking about bridging the digital divide. So what roadmap does government need? We also have to look at this when it comes to connectivity. There is one major issue that is uh, hindering the progress of Africa. And then that is what uh, spectrum allocation. Now all the spectrum allocations that we have within uh, the African or developing countries are geared towards the big private organizations, let's say Vodafone, MTN, and, and uh, et cetera. And, you know, these organizations tend to look at areas where uh, they will yield profits. If they are supposed to go to a rural community that they think uh, they will not benefit anything from them, they will not go. And, um, and sometimes they, they use their power to influence governments, not to even make any allocation for, let's say, small organization that would like to go into those areas. So if you can critically look at spectrum allocation and say that, uh, okay, government will say that we are making this spectrum available for small NGOs like ISOC, for example, can take this up and then areas that government or private sector wouldn't like to go, then you see these small private organizations, uh, NGOs, taking up these lands and then going to those areas where 
internet is not reaching. So we, we, we should be solving uh, a problem. And then the, the last point I'll talk about is um, community networks, a key point uh, to the fourth point I just uh, spoke about. And uh, the untapped and often misapplied uh, universal access fund uh, will be key to this. Yes, we also have to uh, look into funding of such projects. And I think I spoke about this already. So especially when it comes to funding, uh, you know, government, if it is true government, you know, government has its plans already. They have their policy plans already. And sometimes um, when they see other policies to be more important to uh, uh, this internet connectivity or internet infrastructure, they tend to divert some of this funding to other areas. Uh, example that we see is this uh, COVID that we have, that government is looking for money everywhere. And uh, I know that some funding from some of these areas were diverted into uh, the COVID and, and all that. So it becomes difficult and to, to implement. And then one other trend that uh, we are noticing is that now government is now moving towards a uh, transition. Um, that means I don't know whether they are now realizing the, the internet or technology is, is, is another area that is fetching more money. So they are trying to veer towards that direction and now beginning to tax some of the very things or some of the, technology, the technological things that the government is saying we should, uh, we should use or we should, all citizens should use or government taking to the rural communities is now, turning, uh, is now taxing these same people. And uh, we are seeing a retrogression from people uh, using some of this uh, platform. So uh, I think uh, Henriette is here. We, we need to begin to start looking at this uh, tax issue very well and see how we can help address this. Because in my country, for example, uh, this is a trend now. And then the, the percentage at which government is putting on this uh, technologies is, is, is so high that uh, if we are not careful, we might go back to the days where, uh, the dark days where you see people not even using uh, technology. So that's the trend that uh, we are seeing. Uh, thank you very much. So. Uh, Wisdom, thank you so much. Um, I, one particular thing that stood out for me, I, I've often thought about local content as, you know, um, as being in languages which are which are relevant to, to local populations. It was really interesting to take that example of agriculture and, and think of it as as weather forecasts and crop diseases that are that are relevant. It's not just entertainment or um, but it's it's real practical information that can help um, with local economies. So that was a, a really interesting example of, of where local and content is relevant. Uh, and why that's important. Um, I'm gonna to pass to our, our last speaker um, before we open the floor. And, and it's great to see there are already some questions in the chat. Um, Jane Coffin is um, one of the many strengths of her bow is that she's a member of the IGF's policy network on meaningful access. Um, it has a working group, a multi-stakeholder working group, and she's one of the members of that working group. Um, and so that's another way in which we're tying in um, this issue is relevant to, to the IGF, not just because it's one of the issues of, of this meeting, but because it's, it's been an issue being looked at by um, an IGF policy network throughout the year. Um, so things are, are tying together. So Jane, let me pass over to you to introduce yourself, but also to talk to us about the role of, of regulators and policymakers. Thanks. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's a pleasure to see everyone here and in the room. Uh, I should say here on Zoom. 
um, the Policy Network for Meaningful Access has been looking at the, the important issues of universal connectivity and meaningful connectivity and how a multi-stakeholder approach can come up with recommendations, suggestions, using some of the great case studies and information that's out there and um, circulating that information more widely, but also problem solving together. Um, that theme of collaboration, um, every person who has spoken from John to Pepper to Wisdom to Tracy has, has hit upon collaboration, the importance of new hybrid and, and, and enabling approaches. I call them hybrid because we've seen some of these approaches um, work in other um, sectors from the microfinance perspective, but we're looking at uh, the challenge again from different um, lenses or eyes now of making sure that connectivity isn't a secondary um, consideration. We're seeing so many um, funders say, well, of course there's connectivity or they assume there's connectivity when they're looking at financing a project in some local areas. Um, philanthropy is only donating about 1% toward connectivity solutions. And as Pepper said, the private sector has been putting so much investment um, and governments, of course, with their own human capital and their projects um, where there's government financing and the major banks. But if we're going to solve the connectivity problem and help lower the cost of connectivity with some new innovative solutions on the ground, we are going to have to work together in this new collaborative model from the multi-stakeholder perspective. And I think Wisdom, you and Tracy and others have said, it's that local sustainability angle where digital skills do need to be heightened and training has to be brought in. And Wisdom, you made a point about projects where people would come into a country and work on a project and then leave. I was in the field for five years <laughs> working on projects and I thought, wait a second, this isn't about um, another philosophy coming into a country trying to replace the philosophy in a country. It should be about local philosophy, how things work in a local environment and finding ways for sustainability at that local level with knowledge and expertise that can be brought in, but it must be a local, local solution. I've seen that with community networks as Pepper has noted and with internet exchange points. Um, I've had the pleasure of being in almost all of your countries and working on issues like this to help with connectivity. Um, it does take also this, uh, the civil society and technical community approaches working together in that collaborative spirit. I'm gonna highlight three or four different air, um, projects that I know of that have included a, a government approach with civil society, the technical community and local capacity building that have led to better connectivity. And as some of the, um, the chat questions have alluded to better price points for local people and users. And it's those local price points are usually because there's an innovative model for connectivity on the ground or local content as Ben had uh, mentioned local content generation that involves the local players. It's not just people coming in from other countries saying you should do this. It's been generated at that local level, therefore it's sustainable, but it's also a little bit more agile. There's more innovation going into the technology and the networks themselves, whether you're looking at a, a Wi-Fi mobile uh, fixed network that has been put in by a community. We've seen that in Spain with Guifi. They've trenched fiber, they've put in mobile base stations and they have Wi-Fi and they're an APC member. So it's the Association for Progressive Communications, the group that Henriette comes from, the organization that I used to work for, the Internet Society has done so much as well in the space, but working with local people, local government, local experts, and some international experts for those local solutions. Brazil just liberalized the six gigahertz band for unlicensed spectrum, yay, Pepper, on spectrum. And wisdom, you mentioned spectrum. It used to be a word that people were so terrified <laughs> that the civil society and the technical community would use. But the fabulous thing about spectrum now is that people are looking more innovative approaches for deploying and allocating and assigning spectrum. It means smaller operators like um, the network in uh, 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 Rizomatica's network in Mexico. The Mexican government put out a social purpose license. It was a brand new license. So they had facilities um, licensing, spectrum licensing and service. So they could operate in a cheaper, better, faster way with innovative use of spectrum. But at that local level, local um, experts were trained in how to set up a network, run the networks and some cheaper pricing was brought in. Um, Peter Bloom and um, Eric Huerta are two key people working on those projects along with APC and others. 
um, at that local level. But the Brazilian six gigahertz liberalization was huge. The whole band was liberalized for unlicensed spectrum. So you can look at open source issues and open standards related projects so that more people can connect to networks. Um, that was with the ISOC Brazilian chapter with APC and FCBO, the development arm of the British government, working with the Brazilian government of those local solutions and a local internet service provider association. So that was a huge victory recently. Uh, and kudos to Brazil for also bringing in um, the concept of for communities of 5,000 and under where traditional operators don't get the return on investment, allowing these community or municipal based networks to thrive and to be authorized. Um, not a heavy regulatory environment. And I wanna stress that because I've been a regulator. I was also in a ministry. So you really have to look at what works, whether you're forbearing on regulation in partnership with your, with your other actors or you're coming in with a super light touch Super Light Touch has recently been implemented in Georgia, the Republic of Georgia, where the ministry, the regulator, the ISP association, Ucho Saturi, who's there with you in um, Karawis, who is a member of the MAG, was one of the key champions on the ground championing a community network, which has turned into multiple regions in Georgia, deploying community networks with everyone from the World Bank, USAID, the Czech Development Agency, the local ISP Association, Economic Development Agency in the region. And that was with $40,000 of ISOC startup funding at, the, at that time. So $40,000, very micro, if you're looking at broad billions that go into the submarine cables and the LEO systems, it can work. And that has just grown and grown. And Ucha can tell you more and more. He was just on a, a panel the other day. And if you look at his Facebook site, you will see all of the fabulous photos. Horses take up the towers. I've, I've seen the photos myself, but this is real local connectivity being built with the help of the, of the national government, the local authorities and international um, funders, but also civil society and the technical community. Kenya just changed their licensing regulations. That was a huge effort with APC, FCDO, some local support with, um, from Machuki Mwangi, who's um, with the Internet Society um, there in Kenya, but change is taking place. And this isn't... Um, hard. It, it takes effort, of course, but there are good models out there now that we can follow. Um, Papua New Guinea, John had mentioned uh, USF, Universal Service. Um, the USF funding in Papua New Guinea will go to the community network. I'm also advocating strongly for USF to be changed in many countries, not a wild radical change, but enough of a change so that it's financing the small startup internet exchange points bottom up and the community networks. And Papua New Guinea is leading the way. People might not know that. Um, and again, that's a, that's a collaborative approach, right? With, with lots of different stakeholders. In the DRC, the third internet exchange point was launched about two months ago with Facebook's help, the ministry's help, the regulator, but the local experts, Nico Shinto on the ground there. And of course with Machuki and some others. Um, that is real connectivity where there's extreme competition because internet exchange points in and of themselves are an open platform. No operator, whether the big operators or small, they all come together equally. So it's that equal open access that's been so critical and bottom-up governance where it's the community itself coming together. And by community, some people say, Jane, you're just talking about a big group hug. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> we're talking about real business people coming together that run networks who problem solve together with the technical community. And there's constant learning, constant capacity development. This is critical. And there's investment coming in from big actors and small. So this is really, really important. It's a hybrid approach. Um, I will stop and say that when Tracy was speaking about the Caribbean and the infrastructure problems there, and we all know that if you don't take a holistic approach to infrastructure development, you won't get that, the rollout of all of the networks together. And so this means government has to work across different sectors. So it's not just the Ministry of Communications or the, the Federal Communications Commission or the regulatory bodies. Um, it has to be an all of government approach because if you're looking at better education, you've got to have the education ministry or authorities working with the communications authorities for that rollout. So it really is about this public-private partnership that Pepper was talking about, but a new type where the public is also the local um, and civil society and the technical community working together. And I think one of the key things that I've seen over time, the last 10, uh, 15 years, we have to get the stories out there. We've done this in the ITU development sector and their study groups where we brought in case studies 
from across different um, societal sectors and government to show other government actors that this is not a scary thing to do. Changing the way you finance, regulate, license, allocate spectrum, it all can be done and it's being done. So I think really, Ben, one of the key things for us as a takeaway is that we can enable better connectivity at better prices if we're being a bit more um, innovative, agile, and looking at some things that exist and figuring out how to adapt it and adopt it in country. So it's not always a cookie cutter or the same way in every country. And I think that's one of the most important things. And I think I would close with, it's super important to listen, to listen to local people, to local government, to local actors, and to those that have seen the, the type of challenge before and that can come in and help. And again, it's help, but not uh, a for, but a with. It has to be with the local communities and the local financers. And I think we're gonna see a shift soon in that meta financing, oh, sorry, I don't mean meta pepper <laughs> in the sense of meta meta, uh, the company, but I mean at the higher levels, when you're looking at strategic financing, you can come in at the local level with smaller amounts of money. I know it takes effort, but we have really smart humans working on the solution and we've seen what small amounts can lead to with, with for greater financing. So I'll stop there, Ben, and turn it back over to you and Henriette, but I just wanna put a pitch in for this new hybrid model and, and ways of thinking and, and don't let a complicated local solution um, be a block. There are ways to unblock this and uh, unblock the bottlenecks per se. Jane, thank you so much. There were so many um, exciting specific examples you gave. Um, it was almost hard to keep track, but it, it's a great example as, as you said at the end of getting stories out there um to show that these kind of new approaches can can make a significant change and and are worth exploring and are not scary um so that was really that was really interesting and, and i appreciate the way that you you tied in with what the other speakers have said as well so i think we're starting to see some uh some threads coming through um from the, the tie-in what everybody's saying um, we're now at, at the part of the meeting where we can open up for um, discussion. Um, and I know there were a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and yet I wonder whether um, you have any questions in the room or whether you'd like to look at some of those questions in the chat. Um, thank you, Ben. Firstly, I want to ask people in the room to put their hands up. Um, you might not all be aware that we're having challenges with accessing the IGF website and the links from here in Katowice. So um, people will be physically putting up their hands. So I've got one speaker in the room. And let me, let me Ben, if it's okay, if we can ask um, that speaker to ask their question, and then I'll pick up on a few in the chat. And everyone else um, remotely, use Zoom to put up your hand and we'll come to you. And those of you here with us, just you can physically raise your hands if you can't do that on Zoom. So I have a person here across from me. Um, just please introduce yourself before you ask your question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, can, you hear, can you hear me, guys? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay, uh, my, name, my name is uh, Naza Nicholas uh, from uh, Tanzania IGF, and I also uh, lead the uh, Internet Society uh, Tanzania chapter. Uh, nice to see you, Jane uh, Coffin, um, talking about um, the work that you have been doing for many years. And uh, I think, uh, the issue of uh, tying the local content and uh, the solutions you know, that work uh, on the ground uh, is very critical um, in terms of uh, bridging the digital gaps. And uh, I know uh, sometimes uh, on the ground, things may appear to be very difficult to, you know, to, to be able to, to do. Uh, but uh, I am driven by, by the idea that uh, when uh, people were saying that pe uh, people were saying uh, people will not go to the moon in the United States uh, long uh, years ago, people went to the moon. 
So I, I believe that uh, although there are challenges, especially when you talk about uh, the spectrum allocation that uh, Wisdom was talking about, um, it is a big issue, uh, which I think uh, together uh, with a lot of uh, creativity and uh, solutions that actually work, we can be able to, uh, uh, to connect everyone. So I believe that um, uh, if we are able to uh, get the importance of local content and the importance of uh, having internet for everyone, that uh, given what uh, the, uh, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us, that uh, you know, internet is no longer a luxury that uh, used to be in some of, of these nations, that we need to make uh, internet uh, be a public good, uh, a sort of uh, highway where everybody that has a car can be able to pass without uh, actually paying too much uh, toll fees to be able to access it. So I think uh, uh, if we are able to get our, you know, um, uh, our local content and be able to drive things from the local uh, perspectives, uh, we will be able to, to accomplish uh, a lot in this uh, area of, um, you know, bridging the digital divide so that internet really becomes uh, the driver of not only the economy, uh, but also um, um, of things like uh, um, uh, uh, solutions for, for areas in the, in the climate change and, and all that. So it is, it is my, uh, my thing that, um, uh, if we are able to collaborate, if you are from uh, whatever planet, if we are able to collaborate and and help ourselves, you know, solve the real problems on the ground and use the internet to be able to solve that, I think we'll be able to address a lot of these challenges. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, everyone. And. Um, Ben, we have um, two, maybe three people in the room who want to contribute, but there are also some comments in the chat and some questions. So I think I should read these and then we can ask our speakers to respond. And then those of you that are here with us, will come back to you. And just everyone be brief so that we can give as many people as possible um, a chance. So earlier there was a question from Ahmad in, in Northern Nigeria talking about the volatility in the access market, that there are multiple players, uh, particularly I think in the virtual mobile uh, market, and you never know how many, you know, they still are and if they are still around. So, you know, how do we deal with that volatility and unreliability in, in the access market? Then there was a question um, from Pio Tiri in, in Myanmar um, saying, um, He'd like to hear our opinions on how the international community can respond and or should respond to the problem of rising prices in internet packages, which used to be affordable, but now seem to be unaffordable because of policies um, from, from, from both the telecoms regulators as well as from individual service providers. Um, and then there was a uh, Another comment from Mark Cavell in the UK saying, often a problem is that different parts of government, different ministries, particularly in the sect economic sectors like agriculture and, and health, do not coordinate by getting round the same table to strategize, pol strategize policy and funding for digital transformation. Um, for all regions of the country. And that reminds me of Wisdom's remark about how uh, 
policies that are planning that takes place centrally is one thing, but if you have the center implemented you know, at the local level without local ownership and participation, it doesn't work. But this challenge of intergovernmental, intersectoral collaboration being insufficient is very important. And, and then I think that is it in terms of questions. Um, and just there's some good uh, uh, examples being shared in the chat by Jane, who, as she said with her remark, she's, she's sharing lots of good cases where we have seen solutions that actually work. And she's mentioning the examples of, of Georgia in particular and saying we should all find uh, Ucha Seturi. He's not in the room, but I can introduce you to him to share more about Georgia. So um, Ben, do you want to go back to the panel now or would you like to take more questions from the room? I don't see any hands up in the Zoom room, but there are hands up in the physical room. Henriette, yeah, I wonder if, um, if it makes sense, if we've got a couple more people in the room and then we do a round of kind of um, closing remarks from each of the speakers, which can respond to the questions that you've just read out and, and the ones we'll hear from now. Okay, let's do that. So first we're going to go to, um, I'm just going to, there's Judith over here. And then we had um, Roberto in the back. Am I right? Anyone else whose hands are up? That's it. And Lily, did you, you fine. So please everyone for the record uh, in our hybrid IGF, um, do introduce yourself, say who you are, where you're from when you ask your question. Judith, over to you. It's Judith Housing for the record. Um, thanks so much, it was a great panel. And I, I'd really much like, and also to talk about what Jane was thinking about and others about the importance of revising your universal po access policy and getting both the ministry and the regulator, as well as um, other civil society to comment and to work on it. And then what is really important is connectivity issues. We need, as the, Nizar was saying, we need connectivity in the rural areas and the past methods have not been working out. So you really need to figure out community network is one way, other spectrum flexibilities are another way. You need to work on all avenues to try to figure out how are we gonna change the focus? Um, IXPs are important because they keep the, the uh, traffic local and a lot of the main expenses are when traffic is not local. The same comments happen with what some of the commenters were saying with um, why it, prices are rising. And they say it's because of policies. It's not really policies are doing it, it's more in the sense of like operators are not following through on how we can work and bring connectivity, can we, how we come up with creative solutions. And that's why the need for changing of policies to make sure that connectivity is the main focus and to make sure that ISPs are looking or other different ways are looking at how we can create local operators who are community based to build up from the bottom and take care of their communities. And so I think that's, I think working with government to change policies is a really good action to take. And thanks so much to the Thoreau to Papua New Guinea, who I've been advising, who have been working on our new universal access policy. And thanks, Judith. And next, oh, we have good. He's about to take the floor. Our next speaker from Katowice. And now, now it is working. Thank you very much, Henriette, and thank you to everyone that came here today. I just wanted to share some reflections with uh, this panel and, of course, the, the people that are following this session. Um, one good thing, yes, uh, sorry, my name is Roberto Zambrana, coming from, I'm a second year MAC member, but also coming from uh, our Bolivian uh, NRI, our Bolivian IGF, which happened to, to be our fourth. Uh, for IGF last uh, November, the last week of November. And I, um, that's what I was wanted to reflect on. I think uh, it's, a, it's fantastic for, that for the last three years, we took again 
the issue of universal access, which after the pandemic, we all agree that it's very, very important and fundamental to solve, not easy, of course. But uh, the important thing is that the work that we do in our countries also to be reflected in the local policy in a way to go to the further in the global policy. In our case, by, for this time, we started a new format in our uh, IGF in order to not only receive more active participation from the people and different stakeholders, but in, in our case, in one of the sessions related with the, with the universal access, what we wanted to do this time was to prepare a document. So we prepared a draft uh, previously to have our, our meeting. And uh, we actually worked in a, in a session called uh, policy proposal workshop. And the idea was to um, use the, the work of the, on this session with all the participants based on a draft document in order to provide uh, concrete recommendations for our local government and, other, uh, and some other stakeholders. So I think that is one of the important ways to have outcomes regarding policy because during the last three ideas, we usually have the same ideas, the same proposals, the same recommendations, but we don't have a strong voice, I think, in order for our governments to follow this kind of uh, recommendation. That's why this time we are planning to prepare this in a public way and make them uh, make this document available for the government, hopefully to have changes and adjustments in our policy. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much for that, Roberto. Um, ben, I think we're back to you now. And I have one more, there's one more hand in the room. So let's have one more speaker and then we'll be back to the virtual space. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's Ekaterina Imitadze from Georgia, so I couldn't help myself <laughs> not to express uh, how much, uh, uh, how empowering it's, uh, is, it is to hear about the good example from Georgia, Ucha Saturi in, in another room, but it's present here, and we will give big thanks from uh, Miss Jane Coffin for, for the nice words, and we also wanted, I also wanted to express that um, I'm as a rep representing Georgia NRA, and there were very good words about the organization that Ucha is, where Ucha is leading and doing on all the nice work he's doing. That I uh, we believe that um, uh, participatory regulation is best thing to do in nowadays. So to make to gather the stakeholder to listen to small and medium operators who are the best ones to some uh, somehow direct the attention for of policymakers and regulators what what are the di best direction best practical direction where to move um, uh, from the policy point of view and from the regulator uh, point of view so we are very much open also to hear about the best practices around the world and this is the best venue for that thank you so much thank you that was it. thanks very much katrina and um ben back to you thank you andrea and it's great to see the participation from people in the room and, and the growing numbers you have there um so at this at this stage, I'm going to go back um, to the four speakers and invite you to um, make some closing remarks, a couple of minutes of closing remarks uh, based on what you've been hearing from others today. And we'll follow the same order that we we spoke in earlier. So, um, Pepper, if I could turn to you first. Thank, thanks, Ben. This has been a really good um, uh, and great interactive uh, discussion. And I'm glad that uh, we have so many attendees, especially on site in the room. Um, uh, you know, I, th I think that uh, we ended up focusing a little bit more on the uh, strict tech, uh, you know, connectivity side um, and didn't really address some of the issues that John raised at the beginning on, you know, the, the, the non-connectivity. But, you know, the, look, the connectivity as, you know, we've been discussing is essential. Without that, nothing else happens, but it's not enough by itself. Uh, and I think that some of the, um, uh, issues and the questions about affordability um, and uh, the sustainability uh, of local players 
uh, is extremely important. Um, that's why, uh, you know, the, I, I mentioned earlier, the project in Peru, which in, includes local, uh, local players. This is not about, you know, consultants parachuting in and leaving. This is actually building local capacity uh, in infrastructure with local operator. And, you know, in rural, rural Peru, where nothing, I, I mentioned where there nothing existed before, there are now uh, 4.7 million people that now have access to uh, really robust mobile broadband that they never had before. And that was because of um, uh, government uh, making changes in policy, but also local participants and local investment um, and local operation in creating this new wholesale operator, in addition to um, you know, global companies like uh, Meta and, and uh, Telefonica participating. Uh, on affordability, I put in the chat, the, uh, uh, because of the really great question, what does affordability mean? Uh, the Alliance for Affordable Internet, A4AI, uh, has created a benchmark that's been adopted by the ITU and essentially everybody that um, at, at the moment, it's, it's at least one gigabyte of data per month um, uh, for less than 2% of a, of a household income. Um, uh, so it's adjusted for local income. And when you look at, and I'll put into the chat, we do a study every year with the uh, economist, it's called the Inclusive Internet Index. And in there, we actually looked at that benchmark for 120 countries um, that in the report re released earlier this year. And what you can see is that the majority of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, are way, way over that, their benchmark, as high as 15, 20, and, and, and higher percentages of monthly income for just the one gigabyte. Uh, and that's why programs uh, such as, um, uh, we have something called Discover, uh, which is a, a skinny internet, a text base in between top-ups because you, you need the full access to the internet. But, but you know, programs like Discover over the last number of years have enabled over 300 million people to be connected and remain connected, but that's not enough. And that's why, uh, and I love it when, you know, we shifted and, and you know, talked about, you know, redefining the partnership. And I won't call it a public-private partnership we need to come up with a better label because it's a um, uh, it's a multi-stakeholder partnership, right? And so it's private sector, it's government, it's civil society, it's uh, local communities, absolutely, because it has to be at the end of the day sustainable in the local communities uh, for you know local local business models, frankly, um, to support um, all the local activity. So I'll stop there. Um, uh, and by the way, the, the, uh, Jane just put in the chat working with um, uh, the um, uh, Caribbean uh, Telecommunications Union. Um, and we, we, and Nigel is here, uh, I guess, online. And, you know, Nigel, we did something uh, with the CTU last week with something called the US Telecommunications Training Institute, looking at new technologies and deployments uh, with OpenRAN, for example, uh, in, in the Caribbean. And these are the types of pro programs and projects that are locally based that are actually going to, you know, continue to close the gap. Last thing, we cannot though ignore the points that John made at the very open, and that is there are all kinds of issues, including affordability, that are preventing total, you know, genuine uh, internet inclusion where everybody can get on and benefit from being online, uh, and and many of those are the human factor uh, issues on adoption and use of the internet. So it goes beyond just uh, networks, although that's the essential, um, but not sufficient uh, starting point. Thank you very much, Pepper. Um, yeah, will, <clears throat> let me just hand straight on to Tracy now. Um, Tracy, do you have any um, closing remarks from you? Or what you've yeah. Um, yeah, sure. from today? Yeah, I just wanted to um, be brief, but uh, to, to tack onto what Pepper was saying about the focusing on connectivity only. And uh, I, I think we try to, to bring into the idea of the meaningful access part of it, the meaningful connectivity, which is um, what A4AI has been doing. But I also wanted to add to that, not just the idea of what is meaningful, 
um, in terms of you know type of quality of service and quality of access, but also the the ability to use the internet itself. One of the biggest issues that we have in our part of the world is the, the issue of digital literacy and digital skills. And once we we talk about connectivity and its purest form and infrastructure and so on, many times we forget that just plugging in <clears throat> the infrastructure and giving someone a device or providing access, even if it's relatively cheap, still doesn't give you the, the what you need to get out of the, the, the connectivity or the access. And that's a big issue. In many parts of the world, and I'm sorry to say, the internet equals social media. And that's not, never a good thing. If the internet only equals social media, um, then much of what the connectivity provides is, is, is not useful. You know, we, we haven't gotten to the stage of um, productivity and entrepreneurship and, 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 you know, what skills can you build on that? And in our part of the world, in, in small and developing states in particular, we would like to build services on top of the internet that we can sell to the world and earn foreign exchange, build income, new and new streams of income, new forms of revenue. And if we don't focus on those aspects and look at connectivity and access and inclusion from that standpoint, from a literacy standpoint, from a skill standpoint, and products that we build out don't have any of those elements in it, then we're just checking boxes and, and using figures, you know, we we are connected at this percent or we the figures are saying that we are, we, we, they fall at this level, but what do you really mean by that? And I think that's one of the things that I didn't want to bring out. And I think that we need to focus on that as well, um, beyond the, the raw numbers and the raw figures. What and what meaningful really means, um, no pun intended, thanks. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Wisdom, turning to you in the room, um, would you have any closing remarks for us? Yes, I, of course I do. Uh, thank you very much. And a lot have been said already. Um, for my closing remark, I think we should begin to link the various uh, internet activities to the various sectors uh, of our economy. Uh, in that way, we, we will be solving a lot of problems uh, in uh, developing countries, uh, specifically uh, when it comes uh, to youth. Uh, we are realizing that the youth unemployment is, is, has doubled. Uh, COVID coming into uh, being, we have our youth uh, unemployment uh, ratios increasing. So we need to serious, seriously look uh, into that and begin to link all these things to the various sectors, uh, especially our Greek sector. Uh, we have the health sector. Um, you, you have the uh, extractive industry where we are beginning to see a lot of land degradations and all that. Um, so if we do this, I think we should be solving the sustainable development goals uh, as well. Where a farmer goes onto the internet and then all the contents that the farmer need is there. Uh, a, a farmer produces. Uh, the produce and then uh, with the help of the internet, the farmer should be able to locate uh, a buyer to come and buy his or her produce. I think this is what uh, the developing countries are, are lacking. And this is what we need. We really need uh, to help bridge the gap. Thank you. Thank you, Wisdom. Um, and let me just pass to our last speaker, Jane. I'll be brief because so much great um, data has been given and a good wrap up. We know that connectivity equals better economic health and better socioeconomic development. And we know that connectivity relies on humans. The networks don't walk by themselves. So the human nets are driving the network nets. And if this is the case, as everyone here has said, and John mentioned in the beginning, we've got to invest in people and capacity building in order to develop more networks. Some of the networks have, are in abandoned markets, I would say. And we need to revitalize those markets with more innovative um, approaches at that local level. So it means enabling policies, new tech uh, investment with great partners, but bringing in that local, local philosophy and know-how and knowledge and increasing it. 
um, I will leave you with that and just say that it is the human nuts that build the net nets, no matter how you're building them. And we've got to bring up the local economic uh, situations in our countries. And so that can be done with capacity building in a more holistic approach. Not just one government agency, as Mark had typed in the chat, but the government agencies do need to get together. Connectivity can't be an afterthought. Thank you, Jane. That, that's a really good wrapping up. Um, and so I'm going to, we, we, we're right at the end now, with less than five minutes left. Um, Lily Bocce, I don't know if she's in the room. She, she agreed at quite a late stage to, to step in and help with the rapporteur. Um, but I, I know she might have been late arriving in the room. Um, Lily, is there, uh, there any kind of uh, summary that you'd like to share from the room? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you've been listening. Um, so very important points raised. And I'm going to do a summary quickly, um, just so just this a build up towards the, the report that would be coming up. So um, the conversation started with the the move of the of the focus of the session on LDCs from past years where it's been on, on cyber security and things happening to now involve, um, you mentioned two main areas. You said universal access and meaningful connectivity, especially hinging on SDG 9 um, and a specific target for um, affordable access for LDCs um, by 2020. And um, the session essentially provided a nuanced um, outline for all stakeholders from different angles to contribute their thoughts to um, universal access. And uh, the thing that stood out in the session would move from um, the issue of capacity building, um, where resources are not adequate and opportunities to solve them are not also adequate. So probably how to match both of them to ensure that the resources, um, um, that there's capacity to really tap into resources and to make them av um, available and continue for um, um, Com community usage and whatnot. And uh, I'm going to move on to talk about the, the, things, the, the things that stood out when it comes to new tech solutions, especially hinging on local initiatives, um, how projects are, are, are funded and also partnerships that should exist, um, the, 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 the diversifying of the partnerships and also the move from just saying public private partnerships to what we term as a multi-stakeholder partnership which involves everybody. Um, the local, the look, the 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 local, um, so the local civil society, technical technical community, and the private and public se um, sectors that exist. And then uh, we also the dimension of the uh, the the priority areas um, that sometimes government will probably leave. Um, um, technology parts, the technology parts out with, uh, and you know, usually assuming a one size fits all for everything. And we mentioned here that that doesn't really um, augur well for when, what you want to do when it comes to advancing technology in communities and especially in LDCs. And there was a mention also of the transfer of skills, um, especially when people are brought in to work on projects and um, creating an enabling environment so that this. The, 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 the opportunity to continue beyond when project, projects are signed off and left, um, the ability to maintain them and also to have this going on and on. And um, to the, the, also the importance of making available local content, especially in languages, and to bridge data gap and, 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 and um, develop and communication gaps, with especially grassroots. Then I'm going to end with the, 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 the point on focusing on a holistic approach to um, the universal assets, which involves accessibility, affordability, connectivity, and literacy, um, and looking at the structural barriers to all three of these. Essentially, the crux of the matter today and the reports will be made available in due time. Thank you so much, Lily. That's great. I, I have a lot of uh, confidence in, in your reporting, and I look forward to to reading the report. Um, so, yeah, Anriette, let me just see if you have some closing remarks and we're pretty much at time, but um, over to you, um, Katowice. I think we, we are out of time. I think it's been an excellent session. I think that we um, learned that we need to start with 
people not to have access. We need to look at local context in a holistic way and our solutions need to respond to those local contexts. We need to look at access as an ecosystem that involves more than connectivity. It's about people, it's about local control and power and agency, and it's about content and sustainability. And, and I think our speakers have actually covered everything. We know we need to do policy and regulation collaboratively and that we need to diversify the business models and the partnerships. So Ben, I think perhaps the only thing that hasn't been said is that we really need data and we need data that's not driven by large operators. I think the one thing I felt that was not said is that often our regulators are fearful of the large operators. They're fearful actually of diversifying their licensing frameworks because they are geared to dealing with these large companies with lots of lawyers. And I think we heard about Spectrum and, and Wisdom talked about that. I think what we need to recognize is, and build on the models of the Caribbean regulators, which I think are beginning to really do this, um, regulators need to be supported and they need to be encouraged to, to, to really gear the activity towards local needs and not towards the power of big, large, multinational mobile operators. That's it from me, Ben, back to you. Thank, thank you, Henriette. Um, great, well, we look forward to providing a written report of this session and thank you everyone for, for taking part from Katowice and, and in the Zoom room here. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for moderating, Ben.